Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Nutrition Hero Podcast. Igniting both the art and the science of functional medicine. Here's your host, Dr. Brad Watts. What's up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to another episode of the Nutrition Hero Podcast. I'm Dr. Brad Watts. Thank you for being with me today. Today, I have a frog in my throat. I don't know what's going on today. I feel good, but those old vocal cords are feeling pretty heavy. <laughs> so I apologize for that, but bear with me. We'll make sure we get through this. Maybe it just makes my radio voice a better radio voice. Who knows? Anyway, today what we're going to do is we're going to go through uh, something that I'm calling winning the war on pain. Winning the war on pain. And so this is going to be some highlights, some overview, and then I'm going to answer some questions that I received um, at an event that I do. Um, it hasn't been every Friday, but it's been seven out of the last, well, six out of the last seven. How about that? It's called a Casual Friday series. And so if you're a provider, if you're interested in a Casual Friday series, what it is, is essentially I'm showing people how to practice functional medicine intelligently so that your patients get better results faster. That's what it is in a nutshell. So we've gone through uh, five or six episodes of it thus far. And I got to say hundreds and hundreds of registrants. It's been pretty fun. So thank you if you are a listener to this podcast and you also have been attending these webinars. Great. It's more of a, a hangout than a webinar. So it's more of a hangout, more of a conversation than a monologue. I hope that's the goal anyway. So today what we're going to do is we're going to go through winning the war on pain. I'm going to expose some information to you that you've heard in the past on this podcast, but not necessarily in the same context as you have now. So we're going to do that today. Additionally, I'm going to answer a couple of questions along the way that I got uh, on Casual Friday that I didn't get to, but I promised that I would. Well, here are those answers, and I'm going to mix them in to the programming here today. So anyway, if you're somebody that's new to nutrition, new to functional medicine, and you want some direction, you want uh, a path forward, a way to try it on, so to speak, test it out, see if your brain and your heart are compatible with functional medicine, and um, it's easier than you think, right? But also, I do have to say this, also makes a huge impact on your patients, right? And so if you're on the fence, you got to consider the impact that you're about to have on your patients. Do it. <laughs> All right. So anyway, as we start uh, with winning the war on pain, what we're going to talk about today specifically is going to be under the classification of neuropathic pain. So it's a chronic pain syndrome. You get a lot of patients that have fibromyalgia, a lot of patients that have metabolic diseases, diabetes, Maybe they have toxicities, et cetera, that start to impact their nervous system. And their body doesn't win that battle. The body doesn't win that battle. One of the things that I like to talk about quite frequently is the body's ability to heal. The body's ability to heal is inherent in you being in your body, right? Like, like if I fall over dead right now and somebody cuts my finger, is it going to heal? Absolutely not. That ain't going to heal, okay? But, right, if I am, you know, blinking my eyes and my heart's beating and somebody cuts my finger, is it going to heal? Absolutely. Part of that process is me being attached, right, that electricity being attached to my body still. When the electricity goes out, boom, it's done. No healing. Okay, so here's what's happening in chronic disease, though, is that that electricity in the body, you, right, you, the spirit you, or you, the energy you, whatever your terminology is, right? But you, right, are the healing power of the body. Isn't that cool? I think it's super cool. But here's the problem. With chronic conditions that progressively get worse or degenerate over time, chronic conditions show up and we have 62 problems that are trying to be solved by the power in your body that heals the edges of a cut together, right? Like I'm a chiropractor, so I first learned about that as innate intelligence. And in my own exploration and experience with supporting patients over the last decade, 
and consulting in cases and seeing how people heal, that's exposed some details about how innate intelligence works, right? It's given me a an appreciation for how it works, and I won't get into it here, but developing a relationship with a person's ability to heal. Okay, maybe we can talk about that in a future podcast, but what happens is, is that innate intelligence, your ability to heal the edges of a cut together in a chronic disease state has 62 fires to put out and it never puts them all completely out, right? 62 fires. And that's a problem. Like the immune forces or your regenerative forces, think about like an army force, okay? Your regenerative troops are spread too thin to win any single battle. And so they don't. So we get these degenerative progressive um, you know, conditions, whether they be demyelinating conditions like multiple sclerosis, whether they be diabetes, autoimmune diseases, you name it. But one thing's for certain, right? That lifestyle and genetics over a period of time are going to give you a chronic health condition, okay? Your chronic health condition. It doesn't have to be a bad condition, right? I'm chronically healthy has been my situation. Chronically healthy. Oh, I appreciate it. It's free. It's phenomenal, right? Chronically healthy. But if you're chronically sick or your patients are chronically sick, you got to consider that also, right? So we got this power in the body that heals the edges of a cut together. It's trying to keep things moving forward. It's trying to, it's built for longevity, by the way. It's not built for comfort, right? Which is why you can see somebody develop diabetes, right? Instead of die. So the body basically has two choices with diabetes, high blood sugar or cell death. And what does your brain pick? High blood sugar every time. Because it'd rather live, you know, overweight, tired, depressed, with numb fingers and toes, eyes that are dimming, strokes, heart attacks, etc. Your body signs its name on the dotted line for that rather than death. Right? Cell death, apoptosis. Right? So your body's built for longevity. It's not built for comfort. Okay, this is a huge topic. Like, I feel like somebody needs to write a book on this. Your body's built for longevity, not for comfort. And there's a a huge area here to explore the problems in health in the United States today. Right? You got 99% of people aiming for comfort, and their body is not built for comfort. So what's the natural result? Chronic disease. And it is. Right, so when we look at uh, chronic disease, one of the subsections in this is going to be neuropathic pain, pain of a chronic nature, not because I sprained my ankle playing basketball, right? Not because of that, but because of metabolic issues, because of immune imbalances, because of vitamin insufficiencies or deficiencies for that matter, because of toxicities for chemicals, whether it be lead or mercury or chlorine, something like that. Right, So when we look at neuropathic pain, it is a chronic health condition. And understanding that people that end up with a neuropathic pain situation, it's lifestyle and genetics that got them there. So what does that mean is going to get them out? To the extent possible, lifestyle and genetics. Never forget that, right? So if you can develop a chronic condition through lifestyle and genetics... Well, for crying out loud, you should be able to improve a chronic condition through lifestyle and genetics. Through lifestyle and genetics. All right, so one of the things that I presented in uh, Casual Friday series is a tool I've developed over the years that gives us an opportunity to uh, keep track of patients. I call it the wedge, right? But it gives us an opportunity to keep track of patients and to make sure that they stay on the right course, that our care is on track, and that it, it organizes a strategy that you can follow, right, so that you can actually have good results with your patients. And better results faster is the tagline that I have on the wedge, right, because ultimately that's what it's about. Right? That's what it's about. I don't care who's right. I care who's accurate, right? There's so many people in natural health care today that just want to be right, right? They would sacrifice patient result for being right. right. So don't aim for being right. Aim for being accurate. And if you aim for being accurate, you're going to help a lot of patients. That's what this wedge protocol that I put together helps us do. So if you want access to that, 
Um, go over to biogenetics.com, the company that I am consulting to for this Casual Friday series, right? And um, just, or you can email Zeb, Z E B, at biogenetics.com, Z E B at biogenetics.com, and he'll get you access to the wedge protocols, how to build effective patient protocols. Just tell him you want access to the Casual Friday series webinars. He'll get you organized there, all right? They're about an hour but uh, each, and, and what they do is they frame functional medicine in a way, in a way that's repeatable, right, and ultimately better results faster. So, so that wedge is super important in our ability to help patients that have chronic pain. We discussed in these, uh, in, throughout the series here, that we take blood chemistry patterns Okay, testing patterns, whether it be blood chemistry, organic acid tests, stool testing, DNA, you know, polymerase chain reaction testing, whatever it is. Okay, um, Dutch testing, I like that one too. But we take these patterns that we find, including genetic SNPs, etc. And when we see these patterns on the patient's testing, what I do is I move that pattern into a protocol sheet. So I have my patterns, move it into a protocol this is all going on in my head, but I put it on a slideshow so you can see what's going on here, right? And and what that does is it allows me to build a protocol. So now I know that my protocol has to address these patterns, not just the patient's symptoms, right? You know, God love them that they have symptoms that need to get better, but I'm not necessarily going after straight symptoms all the time, right? we got to go after the pattern, some of the objective information that tells me about their subjective complaints, Hopefully you get that. So building a protocol or a list of all of the different patterns my protocol has to address, now I can build a protocol supplementally to help patients move in the right direction and harness their ability to heal. It's kind of like herding sheep, right? If you think about sheep as your ability to heal, they're all over the field when you first show up, right? You've seen this. If you haven't seen this, <laughs> you kind of have to YouTube how to herd sheep, okay? The sheep are all over the field. They're kind of doing their own thing. And then you get the, the shepherd out there with his dogs. Okay. And what do they start to do? They start to create a wedge and they start funneling the sheep into a straight line before they enter the fence, right? Into the fold. Well, that's the same thing we're doing with the ability to heal, right? The, the sheep dog, okay, and the shepherd are our protocol. There's no healing in nutrition. I know that's controversial for a lot of people. There's no healing in human cell and tissue product like stem cells. There's no healing in that. Okay. There's no healing in uh, medication, in my opinion. Okay. The ability to heal is inherent in you. You. Medication, stem cell, human cell and tissue product like allograph technology. Medications and supplements. Okay. These direct your ability to heal so that we end up with an outcome. You got to understand that. Like... The human cell and tissue product is not sitting in a vial turning into somebody's new meniscus. It doesn't do that. It has to be introduced to you first. It's just a, a technologically advanced building block that your body, remember the power that heals the edges of the cut together in your body, okay? That electricity uses stem cells to turn into new tissue, okay? It's not sitting in the tube turning into new tissue. Same way. Your body like vitamin C is not sitting on the shelf turning into new cartilage. It's not. All right? Vitamin C is not sitting on the shelf turning into new healthy gum tissue. It's not. It has to be introduced to your body. And then the electricity that keeps your eyes blinking and your heart beating and your brain chugging along, right? That electricity uses those building blocks, however technologically advanced they are, whether it's something simple like magnesium something complex like a human cell and tissue product stem cell, right? Your body uses those things, okay? The ability to heal uses those things, right, in order to create wellness. Well, that's not hard to understand. It's it's weird to talk about it in those terms because we don't really do that in healthcare because everybody's so obsessed with pathology, right? But that's really what's going on. It's really what's going on. So let's look at that, um, you know, in a greater detail here with pain. All right. We build 
This is another wedge I was talking about, by the way, building a protocol with the ability to heal to create wellness. It's another wedge, right? So the wedge is my thing. I don't know. I can't get away from it. <laughs> so, but when we take the wedge application and we start putting it into you know, how to pay, help patients with chronic pain, we got to remember that we're not dealing with acute pain like I just sprained my ankle or broke my leg. We're dealing with chronic pain, right? Pain that has been generated from a metabolic perspective. That's really what we're talking about. So we classify pain, right? We're not into the diagnostic situation. We're not worshiping diagnoses like happens in modern medicine. Okay, we want to know why. Great, fibromyalgia. I'm not going to worship that. Why do they have fibromyalgia? That's what I want to know. Okay, we can start to describe it. We can classify it. We can organize around it, and that helps us with repeatable results. So today, what we're talking about is neuropathic pain, obviously. And neuropathic pain is pain caused by damage or disease affecting the nervous system. Okay, neuropathic pain is associated sometimes with dysesthesia, like abnormal sensation. You get numbness or tingling. And sometimes um, something like allodynia, where people get pain from non-normally painful stimuli. Like I was talking with a gentleman a couple of weeks ago now where uh, his genes, right, genes gave him debilitating pain at his knee, his left knee. Just the fact that he had the fabric from his genes were touching his skin. Hey, that's not normal. I think we can all agree on that, right? It's called allodynia. Allodynia. So in this quick review here, before we get to some of the questions, one of the things that we identified in the medical literature is this thing called a pain switch, right? It's called a, an adenosine A3 receptor, right? Or an A3AR receptor. Adenosine is basically made up of adenine and ribose sugar, okay? And it's used in energy metabolism like ATP, so adenosine triphosphate, adenosine ATP. But it's also used in signal transduction, right? Which cell-to-cell -cell communication, cyclic AMP. All right, so adenosine monophosphate. That is interesting because this is a key in modulating pain stimuli, is making sure that the transmission of pain chills out or the production of pain settles down, however you want to look at that. Okay, so when we look at this A3AR receptor, it's activated obviously by adenosine, right? It's activated by adenosine. So this is from a research article here. Um, that if you want this citation, you're going to have to email Zeb and get, you know, get on that webinar series, right? But it says, further examination reveals that the A3AR activation reduces spinal cord pain processing and, or excuse me, by decreasing the excitability of spinal-wide dynamic range neurons. Okay. Produces supraspinal inhibition of pain reception, right? This is awesome. This is awesome. So why does neuropathy show up? Okay, why does neuropathy show up? Neuropathy shows up. This is a question that I'm going to answer now from our seminar series here. Okay, somebody asked this question. I didn't get to it the other day. Why does neuropathy show up? Neuropathy shows up in chronic disease as the body's ability to clean up reactive oxygen species goes down. Okay, if you just shook your head and you're like, what? is he talking about? Here's what happens. You breathe in oxygen, you eat food, your body mashes the two together and creates ATP energy, like I just mentioned, energy. Side effect of creating energy is reactive oxygen species. Another way to say it, free radical damage. You've heard of that. Free radical damage, okay? Free radical damage. When the free radical damage starts to pile up inside of the cell, the body shuts the door to the cell so that sugar can no longer end up in the cell. Okay, does that make sense? If free radical damage, because we're creating energy out of sugar and oxygen, okay, we're converting energy out of sugar and oxygen, if free radical damage gets too high inside of the cell, the cell becomes insulin resistant. Now sugar is coming in single file now <laughs> instead of, you know, in a crowd. And the sugar in the bloodstream starts to rise. Here's where we get into the problem. Sugar in the bloodstream rots. Okay, It oxidizes. It creates this thing called a glycosylated end product. It's basically, imagine like a racquetball 
with little razor blades on it cruising through your bloodstream. Okay, tiny, <laughs> world's tiniest racquetball. <laughs> okay, but you get the point. It's bouncing all over the place, hacking things up. It's rotting your body from the inside out. And this is why with chronic disease-based neuropathies, you end up seeing uh, the, the neuropathy go from the toes up, okay, or from the fingers up, or it's a patch on their skin before it ends up, you know, being a central motor neuron or something like that, okay? This is interesting to me because this, this glycosylated end product is really why the doctor gets so freaked out when your blood sugar is 400, when your blood sugar is 200, when your blood sugar is 140. This is why they get so freaked out, right? Because your body will rot over time, okay? We don't like that. You shouldn't like that either, obviously. So, when we look at, you know, how to clean up these neuropathy issues, one of the things becomes how do you vacuum up the reactive oxygen species? Okay, that's cool. But then also, how do we handle this elevated blood sugar? Remember, it's an adaptation response. The body sensed the amount of free radical damage inside of the cell, reactive oxygen species, or ROS is how I'll call it. Okay, the body recognized that and allowed insulin resistance to take root blood sugar goes up. So if we want to reverse neuropathic pain, doesn't it stand to reason that we got to start where the problem started? Right? You got to handle the reactive oxygen species. Okay, you got to suck up, you got to vacuum up that free radical damage. Right? You got to get rid of the free radical damage. What then happens is there's more space inside of the cell now to create more ATP energy out of oxygen and blood sugar. Okay, so now we can have our energy values start to go up, right? And you're not so depressed and tired all the time anymore. And then your blood sugar starts to go down. Okay, so we're reversing the adaptation that took place. Hopefully that makes sense. So when the blood sugar starts to go down, because we're spending more of it now, Right? Instead of allowing it to be in the bloodstream and storing it in body, like as body fat, etc. When that happens, right, those little razor blade filled racquetballs cruising around in your bloodstream, glycosylated end products, those chill out. We don't make as many of them. Okay, And that ability to heal the edges of a cut together that your body has, right, you, that ability to heal now starts to take root you can start to see its action in neuropathy. It starts to walk backwards, so to speak. The neuropathy moves from numbness to pain, from pain to tingling, from tingling to normal. Okay? So whatever that, you know, that journey looked like for you. So this is, this is part of the process in handling neuropathic pain is understanding the mechanism of it. Okay? Now, one of the things that we find is that when the A3AR receptor, when this switch is on, your body doesn't feel pain. Okay? So remember, adenosine, adenosine. Adenosine is part of that ATP energy problem. The patient's not making ATP because they have that uh, free radical damage. Okay? They're not making ATP the way they should. So we don't have enough adenosine to spend on turning this light switch on so that we don't feel pain. So now we got pain because the body's rotting from the inside out, and now we have pain because we're not making enough energy, ATP energy, to flip these light switches on. So we're stuck in the darkness of pain, right? So this is that pain switch. It's a, a switch that everybody has. Some people's are a little funky, dilapidated, right? But, big but, right? But I personally feel that based off of my own experience and what I've seen in the literature, that there's help for people with neuropathy. Okay, there's help for that. All right, moving on. All right, one of the things that I presented as a way to assess that scenario, right, is by looking for the reflection, all right, of reactive oxygen species buildup. Okay, follow me on this. Does the patient have diabetes? Yep. Right. Well, definitely the neuropathy is associated with reactive oxygen species and glycosylated end products. Okay. You don't need to know this. I'm just explaining the rationale here. Okay. What if the patient doesn't have diabetes? Can they still have a buildup 
of reactive oxygen species inside of the cell, even without diabetes, that leads to chronic pain? Absolutely. One of the things that we discuss quite often in functional medicine is the reflection of a problem, right? Like you're not going to go, by the way, to test somebody's adenosine levels. You know how they do it? They stick a needle into the pericardial sac around your heart, right? Who's signing up for that? Draw the fluid, all right? And then measure the adenosine. And there's a large error rate for the test reporting. Okay. Nobody's signing up for that, (laughs) right? Nobody's going to do that. Right? I would imagine you wouldn't even be able to find a doctor that would be willing to do that to you. So, like, I'm sure that's just for uh, the research facilities around the country, right? And they're probably doing it on cats. So, anyway, looking at this, when we look at how to assess adenosine, one of the ways in the medical literature where we can look at adenosine issues is by looking at oxidative stress. Okay, oxidative stress. Do we have a buildup of the, of, like, the results of oxidative stress? Well, what does that look like? low glutathione. Remember, reactive oxygen species are produced inside the cell, that free radical damage. Glutathione is an antioxidant, right? Antioxidants vacuum up oxidative stress, right? So just like a dust buster. So glutathione gets in there, sucks that garbage up, moves it on out the cell, creates room for better metabolism, and your pain levels start to go down because you're creating ATP once again, okay? Glutathione. So if we look at a reflection of your glutathione, right, like pyroglutamic acid or something like that on an organic acid test, we see your glutathione values are low, or the the pyroglutamic acid values are low, right, what does that let us know? Either you're not spending glutathione, or you don't have any, okay, you're not spending it, or you're not making it effectively, and so that allows us to assess where we're at, is the metabolic function, right, a causative situation for somebody that has neuropathic pain, okay? So even if they don't have diabetes, you can still have metabolic dysfunction driving that problem. That's the take-home point that I wanted to get. One of the questions that I got uh, last week was, what if my patient doesn't have diabetes? This is why we're talking about this, okay? Your patient, non-diabetic, but still dealing with neuropathic pain, right? This is them. All right. So, with that, what else we talk about? GABA. This is another one. GABA. Right? A question from last week. Patient uh, gets diarrhea when they use GABA. Okay, so, and I'm telling patients to use GABA to downregulate pain transmission, right? From the cortex down, the brain down, okay? Inhibits neuronal activity. So, if I don't want my pain transmission, I don't want my pain fibers sending signals to my brain saying, ouch, Right, GABA, based on the medical literature, it helped dampen that. Okay, this was published in Nature probably 20 years ago, even 2003, right there. That's a long time ago. Right, this is something that we've known for a long time. But here's the here's the moral of the story. Okay, or the answer to the question, I should say. GABA is one of the things that we'll use to help patients with neuropathic pain. Antioxidants like glutathione, um, you know, pain modulators like GABA, etc. But if GABA causes your patient to have diarrhea, we've got to consider the mechanism. Okay, GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter in the central nervous system. Inhibitory. Blocks pain reception. Okay, GABA happens to also be excitatory in the enteric nervous system, the nervous system of your gut. GABA is excitatory in the gut. Oh, see, that's irritating now because your patient needs GABA in order to dampen the pain transmission. But if they take too much GABA, they're going to get diarrhea. They're going to have to sleep in the tub, right? And we don't want that. So what happens um, is you want to make sure that if you're using GABA for pain relief rather than constipation relief, right, you want to make sure that you are supporting your patient with a liposomal version of GABA so that it doesn't ever hit the intestines. Right, so it'll start being absorbed through the mucosal layers in the mouth, the esophagus, you know, the upper part of the small intestine, and by the time we get to having, you know, activity in the enteric nervous system, that GABA has already been absorbed into the bloodstream. All right, so that's where that's at. Um, good question, by the way. So, all right. So anyway, what we like to do is we like to bookend, we're going to bookend pain transmission. How do we do that? antioxidants and straight to the nervous system okay 
If you want more information on how to specifically sort out pain transmission and maybe a diabetic patient, that type of thing, go log on to biogenetics.com and sign up for our free webinar, right? And it's going to be a casual Friday webinar coming up this Friday, actually, 11 a.m. Eastern. It's live, okay? And we should be set there. So very good. All right. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Sorry I didn't get to your questions last week and appreciate that you are following up with me here. And so blessings on the rest of your day. Thank you for being part of the Nutrition Hero family.